Team Fortress. Are you getting nervous I haven't said two yet? One of the most famous games not just in Valve's library, but all of video games. Games released as far back as TF2 rarely get a fraction of the support it gets today, with player numbers reaching their peak within the last year. That's despite Valve really not treating it that way. <laughs> Guess what joke aged depressingly well. I've said it before, but if you have a game that plays like Team Fortress 2, you've got a pretty popular game. But if you have a game that plays like this, with characters like that, you've got a cultural landmark. TF2 no doubt owes its longevity to its character. In a time where shooter characters weren't really allowed to talk, the colorful personalities of the Nine Mercenaries were a breath of fresh air. There was only just released a feature-length horror film starring these guys, and then two minutes later we're back in the conga line. I've been stuck in this thing for seven years, help me! People are really attached to these characters. So let's get even more attached. Which TF2 Merc would make the best boyfriend? But Jack, isn't talking about dating all these dudes kinda gay? <laughs> well, let me ask you this one, Buster. Where's that kinda coming from? So, how do you determine which of these guys is gonna make the best boyfriend? or husband, or eventual widow. Well, the system for figuring this out is pretty simple. Thankfully, the most we're going to need to do when tackling gameplay is look for voice lines where the most personality comes out. Thank God! Supplementary material is where large amounts of the Merc's personalities are filled in, so across source filmmaker shorts, comics, and other promotional material, we'll be able to gather the information we need to declare hot or not. There are some pieces of information we'll need to disregard, however. For instance, Man vs. Machine implies that every class is a multi-billionaire, due to being free to collect the money that Grey Man's robots run on. That's not gonna be how this works. Every merc is around the income level you'd expect. Someone like Spy is incredibly well off. Someone like Soldier is incredibly... well... off. Now, there is an element of subjectivity to all this. The rules of love are not as hard and fast as they are with war crimes, though I mean, there's probably some crossover, uh, no napalm, no shooting at the medic, pay on the first date. What one person finds attractive, another might find repulsive. Some people like big muscles, other people like them skinny. Some people like arson, other people don't. You do you. Just do it behind bulletproof glass if that's okay. With the admin out of the way, it's time to solve once and for all which one of these guys is gonna make the best boyfriend. First up is, of course, Scout, and we're starting in a good place, since we have an entire SFM animation dedicated to this exact subject. And in terms of love, Scout's hopeless. The whole thing is about Scout wanting to go on a date with Miss Pauling, and when he gets the chance to ask her out, he just dies on the spot. It takes a three day long training montage and the fear of death for him to work up the courage to fail even worse this time. Scout has no game whatsoever. He's able to pick up this demagogue of an SFM model off the basis of them both having buckets of fried chicken. But if that would work on you, you have way more to evaluate than you realize. But that's just an expiration date, just a small vertical slice of Scout's life. Unfortunately, though, Miss Pauling agreeing to go on a date with him at the end might be the highlight of Scout's entire life. He's got major unresolved issues surrounding his dad, who just vanished into thin air, and either has a very poor education, or no education at all. He can't read. Looking at a book doesn't count as reading it. He's also oddly clingy when it comes to his relationships. It's probably because his dad abandoned him, but when competitive mode got added to the game, Scout got voice lines that made him sound incredibly needy. Hey, I'll say it. Everybody else here is too scared to say it, but I'll just say what everybody's thinking. We're all best friends. We are all dear, dear friends. Birthday party at my place this weekend, by the way. Nobody showed up last weekend, so I figured, no, 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 big whoop, I just have it again. Go team, everybody! Six train killers, am I right? Best of the best. 
and best friends. We don't say it a lot or at all, but we're all feeling it here in our hearts. You know, the friend, the friendship. This of course goes for a majority of the cast, but Scout is also incredibly foul-mouthed. Some of them like to include a bit of flowery language or a nice bit of clever wordplay, but Scout is among the more I am owning you, you fat, bald, fatty, fat, 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 blunt. Personality-wise, it's hard to say that Scout has much of a soft side. Financially as well, kind of in ruin. He's one of the only classes whose living arrangements can't even be speculated on, so it could be anywhere from the Red Team barracks, to an apartment, to a trailer park, to back at home. What he has in the bank is even worse, because it ain't money. See, Scout idolizes Tom Jones, and dumped all the money he has into 12 cubic yards of Tom Jones memorabilia. Kinda odd to value your collection in perimeter, but far be it from me to judge. Comparing what's in the safe to its real-world equivalent, which is… stupid, there's some expensive stuff in here, but not a lot of it. However, that's in our world, and in the TF2 universe, Tom Jones is dead. It's bound to start shooting up in price sooner or later, but as for immediate funds for things like dates and presents and water, Scout's all but broke. So that all has to sound pretty negative. You may start thinking that dating a gun-toting psychopath might be a bad choice, but there are a few things that you can levy in Scout's favor. The top of the list is that he has the mandate of heaven. God himself admits that he created Scout as his gift to all women, but this is just a dying delusion, right? Because why would God brag about having three foosball tables? I don't really know if the Heavenly Father has space for a fourth foosball table. Well, no, because in the same sequence, we can see Tom Jones is in heaven, and since Scout doesn't know that he's dead, that means that this is the actual, factual heaven. Tom Jones is then killed again. So he is actually the perfectly crafted man, and that does reflect in him being incredibly physically fit. He has one of the better physiques among the mercenaries, is more conventionally attractive, enjoys comic books that he can't read, is the first non-Brazilian to discover how to do not just a double, but triple jump. Really, Scout's not the worst. He ain't getting a good look at the podium, but you could do worse than Scout. And it just so happens worse than Scout is who's next. Soldier! Oh god, this is easy. So the soldier, real name Jane Doe, is as far from a partner as you could ever hope to get. Soldier is incredibly paranoid all of the time. His home has not one, but two failsafes to kill anybody who approaches the front door with either a shotgun blast or neck snap. That home, by the way, is most likely abandoned, with soldiers squatting inside. Said insides are littered with nothing but survival tools, discarded fast food containers, and army surplus supplies. That's not his only home, though. He does eventually trade up in the world and start bumming around someone else's house. That someone else is Marasmus, an ancient wizard who's older than time and responsible for making Halloween a TF2 player's Christmas. His problems don't just end at being paranoid, though. He's also incredibly quick to anger, has no sense of decency, and is jingoistic to the point of violence. Every single country on Earth is lesser than America in the soldier's eyes, and that probably makes him the most racist class. The fact that there's competition in that regard also should be a red flag, but you're already in too deep. At the same time, though, he's weirdly one of the softer characters in terms of his insults. He can't really put into words what he hates about each country, more so that he just hates them for not being American. Sure, he's pretty venomous to Demo Man, but that's just how friends talk. You're like the Cyclops of Greek myth! Except you are Scottish, and I hate you! Don't let that fool you, though. He's gonna do detailed research on your ethnic background so he can accurately tell you which country to go back to. Also, if Scout has a poor education, a soldier is actively forgetting things every day. This is the guy whose main innovative movement method involves impromptu double amputations. Well, at least he found a way to do it safely. The commie that invented gravity is gonna pay! That said, I think he might actually be a more capable reader than Scout, since he's able to read and determine the particulars of the Man Brothers' will after they're both killed. 
Okay, but what does the soldier have going for him? I know it's hard to resist a man who knows his P's from his Q's, but what else does he have? Well, for starters, he's kind of a jack of all trades. Literally, all trades. In a single comic, we find out that he's a priest, exorcist, and lawyer, on top of stints as a public defender, and the only job he's likely to keep after the first day, a park ranger. He's also a homeowner, or is at least just squatting in a much more legal fashion, as he stays in Marasmus's castle after it's turned into a raccoon sanctuary. One of his positives is that he's a lawyer. Do you have any idea how many lawyers are in hell? Soldier leads the pack immediately as the worst of the worst. There's no one in this entire ranking that is beating Soldier as the worst possible partner of all time. Is what I would say if it was not for one more thing. He's not even an option. That's right, ladies, this prime cut of All-American Beef is off the market. In the TF2 comics, Soldier not only starts, but maintains a relationship with one of Heavy's sisters, Zana. It's an extremely loving one, too. Soldier thinks the world of Zana, and in turn, Zana loves everything about the Soldier. They fight robots naked while covered in honey. That's something called a true love. For as terrible as Soldier is as a potential partner, it can't be argued to begin with, as he's taken. Pyro is next, and don't worry. I'll avoid getting things mixed up. So Pyro's... Everything is kind of a mystery. We know that he was recruited into the Gravel Wars by Saxton Hale, but what he could have that she could possibly want is unknown. All he seems to be concerned with is her fire, and he's doing his best to spread the good word. That's because Pyro isn't really functioning on the same level as the rest of us. Pyro sees the world in Pyrovision, which leaves her seeing the world as a techno-colored fantasy where fire is a stand-in for rainbows. That means if we really want to try and extrapolate this out, that's... A positive. He wants to spread as much happiness as possible, and it, it just so happens to be by coating the world in as much fire as possible. However, it doesn't really matter so much what they think they're doing as what they're actually doing. A pyro is by far the most brutal class out of the entire lineup, with Meet the Pyro throwing in the Pyroland bits to try and distract you from how horrible what she's actually doing is. He has the entire rest of the team terrified, and these are hardened soldiers. Heavy is more than happy to recount a long and arduous torture of an engineer as the funniest story he knows, but Pyro... Now they're fucked, man. The saddest part is, though, that she needs fire to be happy. In the comics, Pyro is seen in a life without fire, and they're beyond miserable. The happiness and color of Pyroland is replaced with boring gray blocks and mumbled gibberish. It's not until Soldier and Miss Pauling start a five-alarm fire on the skyscraper next to her that he springs back to life and is finally ready to start getting back into the swing of things. The swing of things. However, without the fire, Pyro also proves to be a phenomenal business creature. She ends up leading an engineering company all the way to their highest earning quarter in history, and he's knowledgeable to some degree about craftsmanship. Lots of Pyro's weapons are homemade, including a lion's share of her flamethrowers and melee weapons. Yeah, he invented a new weapon by yanking her neighbor's mailbox out of the ground, but the biggest thing holding back Pyro from potential partner status is the pyromania, the suit, the indeterminate species. Yeah, 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 that stuff too, but um, the big one is uh, that this one scene in the office building is the most that the Pyro gets across all the comics put together. Pyro is incredibly underdeveloped as far as the mercenaries go, which makes sense when their most memorable quote is <laughs> But compared to someone like Heavy, or Demo, or Sniper, or Spy, you're only left with the really bad stuff and none of the humanizing stuff that the other ones get. Pyro isn't even on the dating radar. Unlike Soldier, who at least has potential homes, and Scout, who we can throw darts in the direction of a guess of, Pyro's probably just wandering the American Southwest, setting things on fire, and then 
walking away. Miss Pauling talks to Pyro during contracts like she's a child. You can send Pyro a Valentine's Day card, but all he's gonna do with it is use it as kindling. It's gonna be so much fun at TGI Fridays, but as soon as someone lights the candles on a birthday cake, the police will just have your teeth to identify you by. Next up is Demo Man, and if you're a gold digger, Tavish Magroot is loaded out the ears. Easily the most successful of the mercs, Demo Man is pulling in $5 million a year across three different jobs. We know demolitions is one of them, and you can probably say that legal demolition is the other, but but what's the third one? <laughs> Maybe you don't need to know everything. This allows him to own a mansion for himself, his mother, and his possessed headhunting claymore. <laughs> Living arrangements can be complicated. He's also on the more put-together end of the spectrum of the mercs, seeing as he's able to hold down all those jobs on top of taking care of his mother and killing people. Demo Man is on the pyro side of the innate danger spectrum, though. Just like Soldier and to a lesser, much more coping extent pyro, Demo has discovered that walking is a small price to pay for jumping. If his choice of interview locale in Meet the Demo Man is anything to go off of, there are at least a few rooms in his mansion dedicated to explosives, so open the wrong door and... They would certainly be that way if his mother had her way. That overbearing mother, on top of being a more general buzzkill, does start to lead into more of the problems with Demo Man. He has a very complicated upbringing, probably among the worst that we know of. Demo Man spent a lot of his childhood in an orphanage before being adopted by his blood parents, since they needed to wait to see if his demolitions expertise would manifest. After that, he was tempted by the Bominomicom into reading its dark secrets, which resulted in him losing an eye and creating Monoculus, which attacks Demo and the other mercenaries every Halloween. Demo Man is very linked to magic, weirdly, with the Bominomicon as well as the Islander, which is, again, a possessed sword that hungers to turn necks into vacant lots, and as well we find out in the comics that the Bominomicon and Monoculus have permanently cursed the Demo Man's left eye socket, so that if he ever tries to fill the void, he'll get another Monoculus. All of this has manifested itself into an intense self-loathing in the Demo Man, which comes out when he's drunk enough, which paints him as somebody who is incredibly embarrassed by his very existence. He does not sound happy to be a black Scottish cyclops. On that topic, yeah, Demo Man's a drunk. I'd say a drunken wreck, but really it's only a problem when he runs out. Not that he gets violent or anything, no, that's gonna happen, scrumpy or not. What I mean is that in the TF2 comics, after not getting any booze and having to drink water for a couple of hours, Demo's body goes into a full-on shutdown. You might be hearing all these negatives and think, this is one of the good ones? You know who we're talking about, right? Demo Man has certainly poisoned himself with booze beyond repair and attracts magic to himself like golf balls attract clubs, but he is on the good end of the spectrum. What that says about the spectrum itself is up for you to decide. If you want someone who seems to leapfrog the spectrum altogether, though, that honor belongs to Heavy. Yes, TF2's mascot seems to have had special care given to show him as the most least crazy person on the team. Now, in all fairness, Heavy has the deck stacked in his favor. Literally, he's got a deck, and everybody else is just scrapping for loose Free Realm cards. Heavy was one of the four characters picked to be in the first Poker Night at the Inventory game, made by Telltale. Seemingly out of a hat, or by which employee could say a name the fastest. Heavy in this game has more characterization than pretty much any other merc, some of which is vital lore that you'd find out first in this game before it appeared in any official Valve material. Heavy is a very learned man, studying for years to get a degree in Russian literature. He can read! Moreover, he enjoys the fine arts, like the music of Huey Lewis and the news, and movies like The Dirty Dozen and Rocky IV. Don't try and watch past the first fight. He calls that a feel-good ending. That doesn't mean there isn't a lot of pain behind those big muscles. He spent a lot of his young life in a Russian gulag with his sisters and mother after they were sent there for his father's counter-revolutionary actions during the Russian Civil War of 1917. 
Around 1940 to 1941, him and his family, sans dad, were forced to live in a gulag for three months until it burned to the ground, all the prisoners escaped, and the guards were murdered in grisly ways. Heavy really likes talking about this. From there, his family went to live in a mountain range in eastern Siberia, where they would live in fear for years, the majority of Heavy's salary going back to them so they could afford to live and stay hidden so the people that put them in the gulag in the first place wouldn't come back. The Heavy as well seems to abhor senseless violence. When the other people at the poker table ask to hear a story of his with it, he tells a story about holding a dying bird in his hands after another boy killed it with a knife for no reason. Despite the stereotype, Heavy isn't stupid. He's more so quiet and introspective. He has nightmares of medics he failed to protect, has a fear of ghosts probably stemming from all the people he's killed, and often thinks about the families he's left without a father. And then he tells that goddamn Engie story. Yep, for all that kindness and gentle nature, he's still part of a team brought together because of how unstable they are. He may not like senseless violence, but when he's revving up that minigun, baby, it all makes sense. He takes a lot of enjoyment in fighting, stemming from being forced to learn how to box as a young boy. This may have developed into an unhealthy bond with his weaponry. Now, of course it's important to feel comfortable using a gun on the battlefield and to upkeep it properly, but he's an overprotective father for a minigun. Then when he gets a new one, he gives it a lady's name. A redder flag couldn't exist. Imagine having to compete with a guy's affection and your competition is a gun. Now imagine if it wasn't even a contest. Then there are the more vain aspects, like since how Heavy sends back the money that he earns to his family, he's probably not very wealthy and would live in a very utilitarian sort of lifestyle. Just keep exactly as much as he needs to survive and not a cent more. Even with that though, it's hard to say that Heavy still isn't the best option by far. Just don't mention NG. Next up is NG. Oh, no. Of all of his constituents, he's among the most successful. Sure, he doesn't make demo man money, but he managed to invent turrets, dispensers, teleportation, as well as improve on his old family recipe, immortality machines. Those immortality machines have led him and his family to work for the Man Brothers and Administrator for years, and that's likely to come with a healthy pay bonus. NG can do all this thanks to his whopping 11 PhDs in hard science. Without a doubt, he eclipses the rest of his team in terms of intellect, and has 11 more PhDs than the team's doctor. That doesn't mean he's a soft scientist, though. On top of building and designing all of his own machinery, he spent 10 years as a roughneck on Texan oil fields. As well, he's a southern gentleman. While he may smack talk his enemies like the rest of the team, there are only a few from NG that come off as especially mean. Strangely, the most hateful ones are all directed towards Heavy. I'd hold back if I were him. Among the team, he's also the most personable, seeming to be on good terms with just about everyone. Sure, spies are a sticking point, but for Spy, the sticking point is his back. When you manage to make friends with Pyro and Medic, you're either very charismatic or a baboon on fire. In fact, despite being friends with a team of maniacs, it's hard to tell why NG's even lumped in with the rest of them. On a team with eight other lunatics, NG feels kind of out of place. He's not much one for killing, kind of why he built the robots to do it. Oh, sure, the rogue battle engine will drop in with his Widowmaker and Gunslinger to make you wonder, I thought Scout was a lot faster than this. But those are their own breed entirely. Yes, sir, Engie's about as safe a pick as you can get. And does that work against him? I don't know. I feel like if you're setting out to date a mercenary, you want a bit of danger, a bit of mystery, and just the slight chance of dying from a random explosion going off. And if out of that crop you pick the one guy with stability? Well then why did you show up in the first place? Besides, NG has the problem of being just a touch... bland. Oh, he's safe. Sure, he's stoic, loves barbecue, and plays the guitar. But a man who has spent more of his adult life behind a level 3 century than he has talking to other people is gonna want a nice, simple, safe life. So, go for NG if you want to play it safe, but if you're playing it safe, 
what are you even doing here? Ah, now here's a guy where safe is the last word that comes to mind. You know, aside from where does he keep all of his exotic animal parts? Medic is a proud doctor. <clears throat> okay, already wrong. Medic's status as an actual doctor has been up for debate for a long time. Some pieces of info say he is one, others say he had his medical license and then lost it, and some say he was never one to begin with. I think the meet the medic explanation where he used to be a licensed doctor is the best one. It fits his whole affront to God style he takes with his surgeries. Speaking of which, is medic a Nazi? No. It's not funny if he's a Nazi. What he is, though, is a sadistic, sociopathic human butcher with a tendency to ignore any sense of morality, medical obligation, or human decency to further his research. So I get the confusion. Medic is racing down to be an even worse choice than Pyro. At the very least, Pyro doesn't know she's doing bad, even if he's torching an orphanage as we speak. Medic got all the kids out of the orphanage, but only to discover if being an orphan was somehow hereditary. If you look at what Medic's done to his own teammates, it should be abundantly clear why you shouldn't let this guy know where you live. He likes the heavy and not only blew up his heart and replaced it with the Loch Ness monsters, but broke one of his ribs and told him to, nah, get over it. The classic mercs he teams up with in the comics end up almost getting uteruses put into them. Luckily, he just sewed three into one guy, which seems to have placated him for a while. It's only a few panels later he admits to considering the classic and TF2 mercs to be more experiments over comrades, which extends way further than the physical damage he's done to them. Oh, sure, you can chalk up the scooping he's done of Demo's brain, the bird he's stuck inside Scout's chest. Really, just think of a problem with the mercs and then flip a coin. Heads, they were born that way. Tails, Medic did it. All of this, of course, made him a first ballot pick for Hell. It's while he's in Hell that he reveals that he medically grafted the other mercs' souls to his own to make sure the devil didn't have a controlling share. He booted Satan off the board of directors of his soul. He then sold one of those souls to Satan for a pen. Medic is undoubtedly the worst of the worst when it comes to options for partners. Pyro at least has innocence working for him. There's only one thing Medic has going for them. And I'll be honest, might be enough. Confidence. Medic totally believes everything he says. They at least have the sense to be delightfully insane. You're gonna get at least a nervous chuckle in as he explains how he's gonna replace your lungs with a Doberman's so you'll literally have that dog in you. He'll be great to have as a friend to hear about what he's up to next, but as someone with working knowledge of your sleep schedule, absolutely not. How much does Sniper piss? So, this experiment is based entirely around this scene from Meet the Sniper. In terms of canonical material, this is the best showcase of Sniper's pissing potential. We know from the Gerardi ad comic that Sniper takes special pills that have enlarged his kidneys to three times the size they normally are, and that he regularly suffers from organ failure. It is so sexy how your appendix exploded. So Sniper made the crucial error in this scene of leaving a clock on the wall in the background that makes this very, very easy. His day starts at 4 a.m. and we get to observe him up until 7.15 a.m. when he takes his first shot. Unrealistic, as a sniper main would have missed hundreds of shots in that time. Within the first 20 minutes of waiting, he already has to pee, and pisses around a fourth of a mason jar worth of piss. Then, 20 minutes later, at 4.40, he rounds it out to a nice third. It takes until 5.30 for the next piss break to get the jar up halfway, but then around 5.45, he's not only topped up the first one, but gotten to work on a new jar. Before 6 o'clock, he's already topped that one off to the very rim and has gotten to work on a new one. And by the time he finally takes the shot at 7.15, he has stopped to pee eight times and has filled three and a half mason jars with his own piss. And not all pisses are created equal. The first time he pisses, he barely has any fluid in him and makes it about a fourth of the way up the mason jar. Piss number eight, though, manages to fill up an entire mason jar on its own. But this doesn't really illustrate the point very well. 
we're gonna need to find a way to find the dimensions of a mason jar. By bringing this into Photoshop, making a line here, a line here, another line here, a few more squiggly lines up here, that's Goku. That's not gonna help us, so you have to buy a real mason jar. This is the average mason jar, used for preserving, pickling, and the most unholy battlefield tactic known to man. These mason jars helpfully denote how much volume they have, filling three cups up to the fill line. With the three filled mason jars, as well as the halfway filled one, accounting for any less than filled ones among the bunch, it's safe to say that Sniper pissed ten cups worth of piss in a little over three hours. In case you can't visualize that... Fill her up, please! That's all off a single pot of coffee, too, on average making 10 cups of coffee or 60 fluid ounces. Sniper managed to take 60 ounces and turn it into 80 with 10 cups of piss. So he managed to break the law of equivalent exchange with his kidneys. Impressive. So if you divide out the time, Sniper takes 8 piss breaks over the course of 180 minutes, which comes out to a piss break every 20 minutes. Sounds absurd. What do you think the recharge time on the Jiradian game is? 20 seconds. Now, let's say we take the average of each piss break, and say that across the eight piss breaks, Sniper pees the average of 10 fluid ounces worth of piss. On the very, very high end of the spectrum, the average man pisses 13 fluid ounces every four hours. That means that Sniper is pissing the same amount of a man who has to piss like a racehorse every 20 minutes. I tell you all this to say that any other trait the man has does not matter when he has to take a long piss every 20 minutes. At any given movie, he's getting up around five times to drain his dingo. What on earth could make you stick around for that? And he's not modest about it. He pisses in jars mid-combat, a fact he is very proud of, declaring himself a yellow belt master of Jurati. He has a jar of piss on him at all times on his backpack, the camper van that is his home no doubt stinks of piss that he's gone nose blind to, and if you think he's stopping the car that is his house to piss, you know he has built an apparatus. It doesn't matter if he's one of the more conventionally attractive mercs, there's just too much piss. And if that wasn't enough, he's not even Australian! Finally is... Benji again. Uh, listen, you're a, just a bit bland for me. You're not even wearing a funny hat this time, so why don't you just... Giddy up now to hell! <laughs> oh, right, France. Spy is our last eligible bachelor, and what a perfect way to end things out. Like father, like son, Spy is also a character with a lot of romance baked into his DNA. He's the mentor for Scout in Expiration Date, trying to help Scout as much as he can despite the former's inability to learn. And unlike Scout, Spy provides evidence that he has experience on the matter. Yes, Spy has indeed bedded Scout's mom, but it's safe to say that it's not a committed relationship. Need proof? Go back to the first entry. That isn't to say he's a user of women. He is, but he does look back on his time with Scout's mom fondly. He even gave her a little pet name. If someone called me their little cauliflower, fuck it, I'd find a way to have their baby. He's also a man of exquisite tastes. Loving fine food and $1,000 suits. This is a man wearing a $10,000 jacket into a job where hazards include bullets. He's also fleshed out a lot in the comics. He's a very reserved man, finding the rest of the team rather annoying, Scout especially. Despite that, he does pull his weight and goes along with whatever's required of him. He's merciful to Miss Pauling when they get captured by the classic mercs, and even offers to split a cyanide tablet with her. He's also strangely one of the only people that refers to certain mercs by their real names rather than their class, so that implies some level of fondness. However, that fondness does not extend to the battlefield. Spy is totally ruthless with his put-downs of the other classes. He has no filter and is extremely personal when he sees an opening. He also has a massive ego issue, finding himself so far above the rest of the mercs that the only way he agrees to help out Scout is if he announces as such to everybody else. And as mentioned before, Spy has a tendency to... 
vanish. Spy is another simple class. What you see is what you get. He's dignified, well put together, respectful, but also so high off his own fumes that air would probably be like poison to him. So that's all the mercs laid bare, their dateability explained, but it's time to put it into plain English. Who's the best, and who's the worst? Starting in reverse order, and the best merc boyfriend is Heavy. The perfect balance of responsibility, stability, and security, Heavy would make the perfect partner for anybody looking for a big, strong bear. Just make peace that you're never, ever gonna beat the gun. After him is NG. Like I said, NG's plain. NG is room temperature water. It's fine. It's safe. You need it. But if you have the option of anything else, you'd go with it. He'll take you to Texas Roadhouse on dates so many times your head will spin. And having a sentry in the room while you boink is gonna really kill the mood. But he's not gonna kill you. Next is Spy. The obvious allure of a man of mystery is strong, but he also has the capabilities to be a real lover. He'll treat you right, but as soon as you start revealing any of your flaws, he'll be certain to keep a mental list of insulting nicknames. After a substantial power gap, like realistically, number four should be the sentry gun or sandwich, a distant next entry is Scout. Scout makes it this high as he's the last merc without a major psychological hiccup that keeps him from functioning in life, let alone in a relationship. Scout is cocky and brash, incapable of an honest conversation that doesn't end with him talking about how big his arms are, but he's got his own charm about him. Some people will find his brand of confidence enticing. These people are strange, but to each their own. Okay, another huge power gap. Maybe you shouldn't date these people. Was that the message I was supposed to learn? Anyway, Demo Man comes next, and I don't know if you can enjoy him for the few hours a day he's lucid. You can probably get some enjoyment out of the relationship, but this is someone who is in constant negotiation with his own organs to not give up on him. He's going through a lot right now. Next up is Sniper. Piss. Next up is Soldier. Taken. All right, that leaves just two, and now's not the time to act like you can't guess. Second worst is Pyro, and worst is Medic. Now, intent matters a lot. It's the difference between manslaughter and murder. Both are extremely passionate about their fields of murder, but if I had to pick between getting those things on a giraffe's head sewn onto mine to see if they give a giraffe psychic powers and getting set on fire, baby, I got the gasoline! Let's light it up!